Welcome everyone to our Google for Nonprofits live stream. Today we'll be talking about how you can manage your volunteers with Google products and in particular with G Suite for Nonprofits. You can look back on all of the past live streams that we've done at our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Google for Nonprofits. And once we're done with this live stream, this video will also be posted to the channel. So if you want to check back in uh, in a couple of hours after we're done and you want to go back through all the great stuff that we're about to talk to you about today, you'll have that ability. So my name is Meredith Zelich. I'm Patricia Dealey. Uh, we're on the Google for Nonprofits team and we're excited to be here with you today. We have our colleagues, uh, Alessia and Kyle, who are keeping track of all the comments and, and I guess messages that are being posted in the chat. So they'll be helping to answer things as we go through the live stream. They'll also be queuing up your questions for Trish and I so that um, as we're going through the session today, we're going to try and get to some of your live questions as well. Um, so that's uh, exciting. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to go through how you can use Google for nonprofits and the products uh, in the suite, and in particular, G Suite for nonprofits, to help out with your volunteer programs. We know that as a nonprofit, volunteers are often really the lifeblood of your organization. You may be uh, small and mighty and only have 10 or 15 people as permanent staff, but maybe you have thousands of volunteers that are helping you uh, get your mission accomplished out in your community. So we're going to start with how do you capture volunteer information from forms? And once you have that information, whether it's you know, understanding whether uh, volunteers can come on a certain day or whether it's capturing new volunteer interest, how can you streamline communication with those volunteers? And that's where we'll talk a bit about Google Groups. We'll talk about how Google Sites can be a way for you to engage and inform your volunteers or, or any external parties in a way that's really efficient and effective for your organization. And then we'll talk about how you can do things like hosting a training with Hangouts Meet, which can be a way to help you reach your volunteers or maybe your board members or other people in your organization if they can't all be physically in one place. And like I mentioned, we'll do Q&A throughout, so um, keep those questions coming in the chat for Alessia and Kyle and they'll hand them off to us. If you would like to follow along, we are talking about a lot of information that's actually captured in a how-to guide that's on our website. So if you look at that blue link in the bottom right, goo.gle slash howto, you can actually find the Manager Volunteers How-To Guide on our website. And it walks through a lot of what we're going to talk about today and also has a bunch of handy links for you if you're feeling a little bit stuck with any of the products that Trish is going to demo for us today, you can actually click through to some of the Help Center content from the G Suite team that walks through in a little bit more detail, you know, where exactly you need to click and what exactly you need to do. So again, the link is at the bottom of the screen. If you type that in, it should take you to that page on our website, uh, and you can have that up and follow along as well. So managing volunteers. Obviously a really important part of a lot of nonprofits day-to-day uh, -day work and we know that it can take a lot of effort to keep track of all the people that are excited about engaging with your nonprofit and doing work uh, for you and on your behalf. Um, we have a lot of volunteers actually internally uh, at Google that like to help out the Google for Nonprofits team so we really do understand that this can be both uh, a blessing, it's great for your organization, it can also be a big challenge. So today, Trish and I are representing our um, fictitious nonprofit that we recently created called East Bay Food Bank. So this is going to be our example nonprofit that we're going to be using to walk you through all the demos today. So East Bay Food Bank, Trish and I are located uh, in the Bay Area in California. Um, we started this food bank to be able to get donations from the community, from farmers markets, businesses, individuals of food and, and um, you know, produce and things like that. And then we review it, you know, kind of take a look at everything we've gotten, package it all up, and give it out to community uh, individuals and families that are in need that have food insecurity. So this is going to be our example nonprofit. You're going to see us referring back to it throughout all of the demos. Um, but imagine that we just started this organization, and there's a lot of interest, maybe from friends, maybe from family and the community, for helping us get this nonprofit off the ground. So we have a lot of excited volunteers. So we need to figure out what we're going to do with all these volunteers. So step one, let's imagine that East Bay Food Bank, we just recently got a shipment of um, 
produce from our local grocery store, maybe it's still perfectly edible and lovely, but it just isn't quite the right shape or size for the store to be able to sell. So now we have all of this extra produce and we need volunteers to come help us out this week to sort through everything, package it into um, you know, the takeaway bags. One really great option, if you have G Suite, is to use Google Forms as a way to collect and aggregate information about your volunteers. So step one with Google Forms is that you can go in, create a new form, and you can customize everything about the form, from the color of the form and the font you use, the image that you use to really make it look and feel like your nonprofit, all the way down to exactly what types of questions you're asking. Do you want multiple choice? Do you want you know, free answer? Do you want someone to pick from a slider, uh, sliding scale? So you have almost kind of infinite flexibility in some ways in how you set up this form to capture the information that's most important to you. And once you have all of that information in one place and you're sort of ready to go, there's a bunch of different ways that you can share this form. So first, you can actually embed it in an email. So Trish is going to show you kind of a bit of this functionality um, with our example, but you can have it show up in a, in a volunteer or someone's email as the form they just fill out right there. The other option is you can use a link. So you can get a link to this form and share it in an email to all of your volunteers or you know, embed it in your website content or in your social media accounts. So imagine kind of all the different places you might want to capture feedback from people. And last but not least, when people finally start filling out your form and you get a bunch of responses, Google Forms has a great built-in uh, kind of data analysis feature. So you can see an example here. Trish is going to show you the example uh, for East Bay Food Bank. But it actually gives you a breakdown of how people are responding to different questions, some really good initial data analysis. And if you want to do more or you have enough responses that you actually want to dig into the data a little bit more, you can download anything out of forms into Google Sheets and then manipulate and move things around and, and play with the data however you want. So I guess, Trish, you want to walk us through our, our East Bay Food Bank example and she's going to present her screen. Yeah, so if I go into my Gmail account and then from here I can quickly open my menu of Google Apps and I'm going to open my Google Drive and from here going to go to the top left and select the new plus button and from here wait for more options to appear and then select a Google form. And so if we imagine we're looking to find out that we want to know what volunteers are going to be available and we're going to just put that in the title box. <laughs> um, volunteer availability for weekdays during the week? Yeah, we just got our food shipment today, so we're going to need people to show up tomorrow, Wednesday. OK. Yeah. So we have options here at the drop-down menu on the right-hand side, which we can add a new question. We can also choose to import questions if we have maybe a spreadsheet or a database of existing questions. We can add um, further information or a description for our form. And in addition, we can add images or maybe videos. If you wanted to use a form for training purposes, you could share other media through here. And you can also add different sections. So maybe there is some information you want to get from some groups of volunteers, but not from everybody who's completing this form. So we're going to start with a first question. And I think we'll want to ask people's name. <laughs> and who is, who is volunteering? <laughs> exactly. So. You also have this drop down at the right hand side, which gives you different options for the type of question format or the type of answer format that you want to solicit. So just to take somebody's name, short answer should suffice in this case. And we're going to want to make this question required, which means anybody completing our form is going to have to complete this. You can also use this duplicate option to quickly duplicate this question um, and save yourself time. And in this case, we might want to ask for the email addresses of the people who are going to complete this form. Uh, you do also have an option to automatically collect the email addresses when people are filling out the form. And we'll look at that a bit later in settings. And Trish, what's the little suggestion thing that just popped up? Which little under, suggestion? Under email address, where it says suggestion, enable email collection setting. So this gives you the option to automatically collect email addresses if you wish to do that oh, automatically. Nice. Okay. 
So next question, we're looking for weekend, weekday availability. So we can select here and you can see we're automatically, automatically offered again the days of the week. So we can save ourselves time and just add all of the days and maybe we'll use the X's here to remove Saturday and Sunday because we don't need that information at this time. And because we want the users to be able to select more than one day of the week if they're available, we're going to change this answer format to checkboxes as opposed to multiple choice. And so while we have volunteers actually on site and helping us out, we want them to be easily recognized as you know, workers or helpers for the East Bay Food Bank. So we're also going to have them wear um, a t-shirt you know, with our nonprofits brand and name on it. So we can quickly add their t-shirt size selection. Um, and then I think the last question we're going to add is um, a time preference. So our mornings or afternoons um, going to suit our volunteers more <laughs> or which option is going to suit the best. And obviously for each question as well, you have the ability to input your own answers. So we're going to add an additional option here for um, any time slot. So if people are available any time of day, uh, they have the option to select that as well. And I think we're going to actually just double check that we've made all of these questions required. Um, that way when somebody goes through, we don't get a couple filled out and have to go back to them and ask them for t-shirt size or things like that. Exactly. So, and we can see actually with the little red star mm -hmm. beside the question that this is um, a required question. And as Meredith mentioned, you have the ability to customize the form so it looks and feels like your nonprofit or like your brand. So this little paint palette up here allows you to adjust, say, the color scheme. Um, you, if you have like a logo or maybe an image that you use to associate with your organization, you know, you can also add that to the form as well. Um, there are some existing templates that you can avail of if they're suitable um, for your needs, or you can also upload your own images, um, which we are going to use for our East Bay Food Bank. And you can just see how this customizes your form and makes it look a little bit more branded for your organization. And the cool thing is there's a lot of smart features built into, I mean, all Google products, but you can see all of those recommendations that Forms was making, like when Trish typed in t-shirt size and it automatically just gave us the, you know, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. Um, same thing with, you know, the images that it automatically gave you a different color palette for your form so that it matches the image that you wanted to, to upload. Yeah, cool. So we're going to look at the settings now just to make sure that everything in here um, is going to meet our needs. So as you can see in here, you can also automatically collect email addresses if you wish. Um, and as you're looking to actually send this form to people outside of your organization, you want to uncheck this box so that this form isn't restricted to people who already have a email addresses on your domain. So quick question, Trish, that came from the chat. Um, Someone from the Oklahoma Performing Arts uh, Organization asked, is there any relevant difference between short answers and paragraph answers, or is it just the size of the answer box in the form? Yeah, it's basically just in a paragraph, you'd have significantly more character yeah. space. Yeah. So that might be like an open-ended question where maybe you want a larger explanation yeah. or you want people to submit more information. Um, but for something that's going to be like a name or a one word or a couple of words, short answer, would suffice. Yep. Awesome. Um, so the last thing you want to do then before actually finalizing your form, um, you want to use this I symbol up here to preview and make sure everything is actually appearing how you would expect it to or how it's going to appear for your users when they receive it. Um, so this is what the live form would look like. Um, and as the administrator of the form, you might actually want to complete this yourself um, just to actually confirm that how the data is being collected is going to meet your needs mm -hmm. or if there's any edits that you might want to come back and make to it before you actually send the form out. Uh, so we're not going to fill it out right now, <laughs> but we're going to go back to the edit option. Um, and then if we're happy with the form and all the questions that we've got in there, 
uh, we're potentially ready to send it. Um, and as Meredith mentioned, when you are ready to send, you have a few different options. So this little envelope symbol allows you to actually embed the form in the email. So when your recipients receive it, the form will actually present in their inbox and they'll be able to complete the form directly there. Mm -hmm. um, the link option allows you to create a link for your form that you can then choose to share um, in whatever format you would like to. And the embed option allows you to actually embed the form um, in HTML, whether on your own website or a partner's website. And then obviously to the right, you have the option to share the form also on your social. So, two more questions. Lots of great questions. Uh, from Breakthrough Cincinnati, uh, can we upload documents to Google Forms? Uh, yep, absolutely. Yeah. So if you pop back into so the form. So if we go back into where we are in the form, mm -hmm. and here where you have the option to add. Oh, I think the question is, can once the form is live, can you have people who are responding to the form upload documents? Oh, OK. So yeah. within settings, Down here, you have the option to give people, I guess, additional control over their responses. So in some cases, you might want to uh, give your users the option to edit after they have submitted, which means I can submit my responses once, but if I want to change my response or if I want to add something to it, I can come back and edit it again later. And if you go back to the live form, one other thing that we can show is um, if you scroll down, let's create like one new question on the bottom. Maybe we want to give people uh, the opportunity to, if we make yeah one new question, maybe we want to give people the opportunity to, oh, maybe we have a release form that people have to download, sign, scan, and then upload back to us. Okay. So if we type in, you know, submit your release form or something like that, in the dropdown under multiple choice, there's a file upload button. So right kind of in the middle, yeah. So. It, it tells you that um, people will have to be kind of signed into Google when they do the file upload question piece of it, um, and that it lets them know that the file that they're uploading will end up in your Google Drive, so it's kind of a letting them know where it's ending up. But yes, there is the option um, for file upload. I think the other question was, is there a way to present time slots and have people choose? It's not quite as as sophisticated as that, there's an option in that dropdown, same place where the file upload was, for um, a calendar picker, like a date picker and a time picker, but the two aren't together. So you're going to have to be a little bit creative about how you might capture that information. Trish is actually going to show like how we might take the data we get from the form we created and filter to sort of understand which of our volunteers are available in the morning or the afternoon on what dates. Yeah, but some of these options that you have here in terms of the answer format, mm -hmm. like multiple choice grid or check checkbox grid, that would give you the option true, to too, have yeah. multiple options within an answer frame that you're giving people like a variety of um, options to actually choose from when yeah, they submit their answers. Yeah, that's true. So you could have date along the top and time along mm -hmm. the bottom, and people could check the boxes that correspond with the right um, times. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So... If we want to pretend that, let's say we've sent this out mm -hmm. and we now have a bunch of responses, what does that look like for people? So if we had potentially sent this form out earlier. Same form. <laughs> same form. This one. There we go. <laughs> when you come back into your form, you would see a summary view. Um, we're at the top here. You can see we've received 20 responses. So if we click on this, um, it gives us an indication of an indication of who has submitted the form, who's responded, um, and also some summary stats on the information that they have submitted. So we can see overall what type of coverage we have for each day of the week in terms of volunteers that are available. Uh, we can also see you know, where the highest demand is in terms of the volunteer t-shirt sizes and where we need to place those orders. And we can also see that, okay, afternoons uh, look like the kind of favorite uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of time preference uh, across the group. Um, and so that's helpful for us at a, at a high level. Um, but that's given the fact that we just had 20 responses here, that's easy enough for us to manage. But in the event that you're capturing information from maybe 
hundreds um, of volunteers, uh, you might want to actually have you know, more opportunity to analyze data further um, or be able to kind of manipulate um, or, or do further data cuts. So if you use the sheet symbol up here, you can actually export um, these responses and all that data to a Google Sheet, and then you have much more opportunity to actually, you know, um, process it and analyze it mm -hmm. in a in a more structured format. Awesome. Couple more questions, and then we might have to move on to the next section. But this is great. Um, can fields like email or phone number basically be formatted to ensure that they come in properly formatted, so that people give you, you know, an email with an at symbol and a dot com? Um, so I think one way to ensure that when you're adding questions that people submit it in the right way is that you could actually give a sample um, in, your, in your form um, of the, how you want the answer to be structured. So say, for example, if you're putting in a question for phone number. <laughs> Slight delay. <laughs> OK, and you can see it, it's quite light in terms of the color here, so maybe um, it's, not it's actually, yeah, the three dots on the right, you have to go into advanced right there, and then, um, yeah, description. There we go. Okay. Um, you could add a description here for, you know, the format that you want to use. So we could say, please use um, format plus one XYZ, XYZ, yep. or something to that effect, or something that indicates um, yeah, how you want them to present uh, the phone number or when they input the, that information. The other option is, I think if you scroll down again to that little, uh, the three dots right there, and you look at response validation, this is an option that you can use. And you can see that you can say, I only want the, the number that the person inputs. And then if you click on the greater than where it says that, to be, um, you know, greater than zero. Maybe you're asking how many, um, you know, family members someone's bringing along, and you know everyone's going to be bringing family members, so you don't want somebody to put in zero. Um, so there are response validation options like that as well uh, that you can play around with so that you get uh, useful information and not kind of somebody entering something in, in the, uh, the wrong way. Um, let's see. Can you allow your participant in the form to add an image? Yep. So they could mm -hmm. they could upload in that file upload that Trish showed an image, you know, a JPEG, a Word doc, a you know, Google Sheets, Google Forms, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and is there a limit on the number of questions? No. Um, I think use your best judgment. I I can't remember. We were talking to some of the people on the team who do um, user experience research. There's a pretty significant drop off in <laughs> things like forms after the first like page or two. So don't create a form that's 500 questions long um, because you will have people that get to like the 30th question and just are like, oh my gosh, I don't have time to do this. So keep kind of keep in mind people are busy and, and use your best judgment there. Um, and last but not least, I would say, let me look at one more question and then we'll see if we can get to the rest of them in chat. Um, where is the ad, how do you add collaborators to a form? Okay. So Trish just edited it, but, but maybe I need to be able to edit it in the future. So if we go to our three dots up here, mm -hmm. okay, that gives you a menu of further options um, for the form overall. So if I want to add a collaborator, um, somebody else who can you know, manage the form, also manage the results or the data as it's being um, added, I can add, well, I've already added Meredith, um, but <laughs> in here, yeah, you would add the email address for whoever it is that you'd like to have the ability to edit the form. Um, and if, if they have this edit ability, that means they're going to be able to make changes to the form itself, as well as view the responses and the data. Uh, if you just want them to be able to see the form, um, you would restrict this to maybe just viewing. Or yeah, I think it's down there. So I think given Given where we are on time, we'll try and get to as many questions in chat as we can. Do you want to show in the spreadsheet like how we'd think about filtering? Um, we're going to do that when we create. A oh group yeah, yeah. In a few okay, minutes. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> all right. Well, so now we have all this great information that Trish just showed us. How do we then contact the volunteers who are free this week to help us with East Bay Food Bank and and doing all of our food review? So. I'm sure that many of you are super familiar with the process of like, who do I need to add to this email? Have I copied the right number of people? Are there people in BCC? Like, how am I doing all of this? 
Google Groups is a really great way for you to ensure you don't leave off individual contacts. So you can set up a group and you can coordinate directly through that group alias to all the individuals in that group. So instead of at the top being that coordinator and having to send four different emails, probably it's the same content you're copy pasting, or making sure you copy the right four people, you can set up your group once that has all the right people in it. And as that coordinator, as, you know, as the point of contact, you just email that group and Google takes care of sending that email to every single person in the group. As the manager of a group at your nonprofit, you have the ability to create the group name, the welcome message, add and remove people, change people's access. So like I can create a group and make Trish a co-manager so that she can do a bunch of the same things that I can. Um, you know, so you could have a volunteer group that maybe your volunteer coordinator owns, but potentially someone in development has managing access so that they can add and remove people that they meet at events. Um, and when you have this group, similar to the way that Trish was sharing the form with me, she could have shared the form with a group. So instead of knowing, um, you know, there's five people at the nonprofit that need access to the volunteer form, she could just add the group that is um, volunteer managers at East Bay Food Bank, and then all the volunteer managers would have access to edit the form. And that's true for Gmail, that's true for Calendar, that's true for Docs. You basically use this email this group as your one point of contact to touch all the members in that group. Okay, so I jumped ahead. But now we're going to look at the data um, and yeah. create a group. Create a group. So again, we can start from our Gmail account in our inbox and we can open our Google Apps menu and go to Google Groups. So we want to create a new group um, specifically for, I think, our volunteers who are available in the afternoons. So we're going to call our group Afternoon Volunteers. Uh, and as you can see, um, it's actually auto populating here with our own domain name. So the group email address is going to be afternoon volunteers at nonprofits demo.org. Mm -hmm. So depending on your nonprofit's domain, you'd be able to customize this um, to your own needs as well. Um, you can give a brief description of what your, your group is for and we're not going to get too worried about adding that right now. Um, and we're going to create the group and then just make sure that we have enough permissions uh, for people outside of our domain mm -hmm. to be able um, to actually receive email from our group. And this is important because internally to your nonprofit, you may want to set up Google Groups. So your development team might want to group your finance team um, you know, folks that are involved in external events, and you want it to be totally closed and protected so that it's only people at your nonprofit that are emailing within that group. But with our volunteer example, we're inviting a bunch of people that are external to our nonprofit, so we have to change the settings for this particular group so that external people can receive emails from this group and post uh, questions to this group. So in order to do that, we're going to go to Manage Group, and then scroll down, go to permissions, mm -hmm. basic permissions, and then where we're looking at select who can join this group, we're going to make, in this case, we're going to go for only invited users because we're going to identify who we're inviting. And we're also going to select allow new users who are not in our organization or currently on our domain. Awesome. And then we're going to save those changes. And it's going to think for a minute. Yeah. And when it's ready, we're <laughs> going to think about how we're going to add people to our group. So maybe let's go to the spreadsheet and we can so, see how this is going to work. Well, first, we're going to select. There are a few different options here for inviting members. Um, in your case, you're always going to want to select invite members so that you can actually give the users the opportunity to accept your invitation to the group um, you know, and voluntarily join. For the purpose of this demo, we're going to directly add people um, as members of the group just to demonstrate so we can show you in real time with that member group populated. Mm -hmm. um, it tells us here that when we enter the email addresses for the group that we should separate them with commas. So we're going to go back to our response um, spreadsheet, which uh, we collected the information in our form earlier. 
And because we're setting up our group for afternoon volunteers, we're first going to filter this information. So we're going to select um, our data to create a filter. And then we're going to quickly just identify from here. We're going to clear these options and select afternoon, uh, the anytime on Thursdays, <laughs> and anytime slot. And then yeah, anytime after 2 p.m. Anytime after yeah. 2 p.m. is pretty good too. Um, and that will bring up for us a list of people who, who are generally going to be available to volu volunteer uh, weekday afternoons. So I'm just going to scroll over a little bit. And to make my life easier in groups, I'm just going to add some commas here. So a little bit of a sheets tutorial. <laughs> oh, nope. It's the shortcut situation. Um, shift. Yeah, there you go. And Nope. <laughs> it's a live demo. Awesome. With a slight delay. <laughs> so now that we've got our list of email addresses who we want to invite to our group, and we've got them separated by commas, we're going to go back to our groups, and we're going to add these email addresses in here. And then we can write a quick me welcome message, um, you know, welcome to East Bay Food Bank Volunteer Group. And obviously, you could normally give a bit more information than that. <laughs> and we are going to add those people to our group. It's kind of think and think. There we go. Mm. 12 people were added to the group. And so if we go back now and actually look at our member list within our group, mm -hmm. we can see um, who has been added. Um, you'll see a few people that are bouncing there. That's because these aren't real people that we've added to <laughs> our group. <laughs> so in your case, that shouldn't happen. Um, but it's a useful data point because yeah. you will see if you're sending an email to someone and that email's bouncing back, Google Groups will tell you like, yikes, this isn't an email that's active anymore. And that could be if, if you collected the email addresses within the form and yeah. somebody mistyped it, yeah. that could um, absolutely happen. Yeah. Um, and also, just so you know, when you go back to your email account, you should also see um, within your Gmail uh, a confirmation that you have created this new group um, and the new email address that you have. Yeah. Uh, and if you did maybe have something that you now wanted to share with your afternoon volunteers, um, you can send them an email. And instead of emailing everybody individually, um, if you wanted to share like a training handbook or you wanted to share a, a time schedule mm -hmm. for upcoming opportunities, uh, you can now just use uh, the group that you've created and you're able to communicate one to many with that simple one email address. Yeah, so you don't have to remember whatever 13 people. Do you want to show what it looks like in groups when an email gets sent to the group? Oh yeah, so we can say um, volunteer, um, orientation schedule. Here it is. And so another useful feature is that any messages that are actually sent um, or responses that you get from people in the group, uh, as an administrator of the group, uh, you will be able to see that once you're, well, in here. Slight delay. <laughs> When in doubt, refresh. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So you can see, yeah, there's a summary of the communications or any emails or messages that have been sent via the group. Um, you can easily keep track of those yeah. in your groups. Account. This can also be really handy because imagine that you have um, a volunteer coordinator and they've been sending out loads of emails to all the volunteers and everything's going really well. And then that person maybe goes on leave or takes a month long vacation or switches to a different organization. If you have all of the, basically the history of what that person has sent because they've been using Google Groups, your next volunteer coordinator that comes in or the person who maybe is helping to manage the volunteer group while your coordinator's out can see everything that's been communicated and like it's all in one place. So there's no more like, oh my gosh, well that's in my email, I guess I'll forward you 15 emails. I can add you to the group as a manager and you'll be able to see basically everything I've ever emailed to the group, how people have responded, um, it's a really, efficient way to kind of keep track of communications as well. 
And similarly to that, um, you know, maybe you have um, a number of volunteers that have actually moved country mm -hmm. or they've left the mm -hmm. organization um, and you can quickly just remove them from your group as well. Um, if you go into members and then manage members, um, so you can make sure that, you know, any information you are sharing on this group alias uh, is with people who are still, you know, actively working with the organization. Yep. So you can update that at any time. Awesome. Couple of questions on groups. Um, one question, can you text through group or hangout? No. Um, groups are really designed for email and document sharing and collaboration, not so much as like a replacement for something like a group chat. Um, there are options to set up like big group chats and things like Google Hangouts. And we're going to show you a little bit how to do the video part of that, not the chat part. Um, but that is one way to kind of get at the same functionality. Um, can you create a subgroup within groups? Yes. You can get very, you can group groups. <laughs> um, you have to be a little bit dangerous. Like it, it can, uh, or sorry, it can be a little bit dangerous because you can get many levels deep. Mm -hmm. But as an example, Trish just made afternoon volunteers. Mm -hmm. We may have morning volunteers. We may have um, weekend. weekend volunteers. We may want at some point to send an email to every single volunteer we've ever you know, engaged with. So we might create a volunteers at group and the members of that group are actually afternoon volunteers, morning volunteers, weekend volunteers. So think about the hierarchy a little bit when you're setting it up, but you can, it can be helpful to have groups within groups. You just have to be mindful about how you're setting that up so that you're not kind of nesting too many things all in one place. Mm -hmm. And must group members have Google accounts? Uh, no, they yeah. don't need to have a Google account. As long as you make sure you check that box that people outside your organization can be invited to and engage in the group, um, people can have any account they want. This basic, basically what Google Groups does is send an email to whatever email they have that you've added into the group um, and, vice, and vice versa. When they send an email to that group, like everyone else in the alias will get it as well if yeah. you set it up that way. Yeah, and just to revisit that, you activate that within permissions and basic permissions. There you can choose if it's just people within your organization, people outside your organization, um, you know, or just invited users yeah. that you want to be able um, to access the group. Yeah. Um, you can add, I don't think there are limits for how many people you can put in a group. I would recommend that you make sure you're keeping it fresh and keep in mind that you really do want people to be opting into these groups. Like let's, let's all be good kind of email citizens and not be like spamming people that don't opt into things. Um, so, so that's something to think about. And you can direct, add, or invite large groups at any given time. Um, you know, I think taking chunks of you know, 10 or 15 or 20 as you're going through, if maybe you have 100 people to upload, is just helpful because you will get some error messages that we didn't get because we kind of set it up that way. But you could have a user that um, you know, the account, like the email isn't entered correctly or something like that. So I would just say kind of chunk up your group of people you're trying to add to the group so that it's a little bit more manageable. Can all email recipients see each other's email addresses? No. Nope. Well, yeah, I mean, you can. You have a lot of control. Trish didn't go into all of the details. There's a lot of advanced settings in groups. I totally encourage you to play around a little bit. Um, you can set it up such that anyone in the group can see anybody else in the group. You can also set up a group so that it's much more controlled. So we, Trish and I could set this group up so that only she and I can see all the volunteers we've added. They can't see each other and they also can't um, post questions directly to the alias so they can't email everybody else in the group. So you can kind of set it up more just to notify. Like we want to be able to blast an email out but we don't want people to be able to respond and like have those reply all threads that I'm sure we've all seen. So. Um, you have a lot of flexibility about how you set it up and you should, you should be mindful again about what do you want this group to do and how do you want people to interact in it so that you can get the settings uh, set up in the right way. Okay, I think given the time, we may move on to our next section, which is all about what do we do with this group now that we have it? Trish has sent this email, um, but maybe we need to get all of these volunteers that have opted in now. We have all these afternoon volunteers, but they have no idea what our processes are at East Bay Food Bank, how we want them to engage with the community when they come and volunteer for us. So how do we efficiently share resources with everyone? We might want to create a site. Yeah, so Google Sites is a great place uh, to 
to centralize information so that you don't have to send out one email every time, here's the volunteer orientation packet, here's the guide. You can create a site and then as people join as volunteers, you add them to the group and they automatically have access to the site. So Google Sites is great because it does not require any experience coding or doing HTML or anything like that. It's all drag and drop and kind of moving pieces around and then your site is live. Uh, you can customize it in a million different ways, font, color, images, layout, number of tabs, uh, number of subheadings and things like that. And uh, we'll show you a little bit how this can look with a simple site, but these can also be you know, pretty kind of complex based on your needs. Google Sites is entirely compatible with all the other Google products that you can think of like calendars, Google Docs, um, Google Maps. So you can embed any of that content that you've created into your site with basically two clicks. So we'll show you what that looks like. But you can keep all the information you're creating in one place and it's not complicated to get it set up. There's a bunch of little functionality that we'll show you, but it's, it's very modular so you can kind of click and, click and drag and drop. Oh, I knew I was gonna go over. Uh -huh. Okay, so now <laughs> let's, create, so. let's create a site. Okay, perfect. So again, we can go back to our inbox if we want to open our Google Apps menu. From here, we can easily access Google Sites. And we're going to hit the option to create. Um, and we're going to use the new updated sites. And when it's ready, <laughs> um, you can see here you have, again, like a blank template, um, but a lot of opportunity for you to customize uh, to your needs. So we're going to call our site East Bay uh, Food Bank Volunteers. And we're going to make sure that we add that title to it as well up here. And we're going to check our menu over here for different options that we might want to include in our website. Um, so first I'm going to add um, a simple text, text box. Uh, I actually previously created um, some text over here so that you wouldn't have to wait for me typing um, in this demo. And so I'm going to copy and paste that uh, in here and maybe just make it a little bit bigger. So I'll use this option to make it a subheading. I might want to align it in the center um, and just to give my volunteers uh, a bit more information. Uh, this image isn't really great, so <laughs> we're going to change our title image um, and maybe we're going to upload the one we used earlier for our form uh, so we can use that one again. Um, so if you have a logo or something that you use consistently um, in your marketing or in your branding, then that might be something that you want to include on your website as well. Awesome. Um, other things that might be helpful to add here uh, we recently created um, a training handbook uh, in slides. So we might want to add that here so that all our volunteers that can access this website can quickly um, review the training handbook mm -hmm. uh, before they actually come to volunteer. And this is basically and pulling up everything that's in Trisha's Google Drive so that anything she's created in Drive will show up in the options to be embedded. So that's kind of nice too. You don't have to download it to your desktop and re-upload it. It's just all there. Um, and one of the other things actually we created earlier um, was a map. Um, so you have the ability within Maps to create a custom map. So maybe you have multiple locations where you accept donations or where you offer your services. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something you want to make more easily kind of found by your users or by your volunteers. So I'm going to select on the option to include a map. Um, and you can see here there's my maps. So the one I created earlier, uh, which is totally fictitious. So please <laughs> don't try and donate any food here. Um, and we might just want to try and resize some of these to make them fit um, together. And you can use those little uh, blue dots to do that. And then I'm going to move my maps up beside um, my training handbook. Um, the other thing that might be useful um, to add here is like a training calendar for mm -hmm. volunteers. So we also earlier um, in our calendar account, we created a calendar for um, our live volunteer orientation sessions that we're going to host. 
Um, so if I select the option to include a calendar, um, you can see here I have a couple of options available mm -hmm. that I can include and I'm going to add my volunteer orientation calendar and then that shows up um, in here as well. Uh, I'm not entirely impressed with this format, so um, I have the option with this, within the settings to show um, my calendar in a weekly format. So I'm going to change it to that, which I think is just a bit clearer oh, yeah. Um, for yeah, my viewers. Awesome. Um, and I guess just in the interest of time, mm -hmm. um, you do have the option up here to preview your site. Um, so selecting this option lets you see how the finished version is going to appear yep. um, for people. And you can also actually double check, OK, how is my website going to look if somebody is um, checking it out on a mobile device? Yeah. Um, so that's generally something you want to check because as we know, a lot of people are more frequently searching on mobile devices yep. and you want to make sure your, your website is easy to follow there. Um, similarly, if you want other people in your organization to be able to manage the site or make updates um, to it, then you would use the person symbol here to share it with others. Um, and when you're ready um, to actually publish it and make mm -hmm. it live, then you would use the publish uh, option to do that. Um, shall I publish it? Uh, Is there something else I need to show here? No, I think, I think that was it. The other thing to keep in mind is that, oh, actually, maybe we want to show um, the options if you publish, if you click to publish, how it, yeah, so how you can pick who sees the website. Okay, yeah, so at the moment, um, it's just actually set to be visible by people on our domain. So we want to adjust that and make sure that I, well, we might want to make it visible to everybody, which means people can find it on the web yep. um, and it's like public. Uh, or we might want to restrict the viewership just to um, the afternoon volunteers mm -hmm. for whom we've actually created this site. Yeah. So in this case, um, I'm going to type in my afternoon dash volunteers um, group that I've created. Mm -hmm. And I don't want them to be able to edit the site directly, but I do want them be, to be able to view the published site. Yep. So I'm going to change that setting and then hit OK. Awesome. Um, and you can change the web address. So you can see that it pre-populated it with the title that Trish picked for the website. But if you, maybe you wanted to shorten it, um, you'll see underneath in the very light gray text that um, that's what it's actually going to show up as in the URL. So, okay. you know, the nice thing is that it was kind of automatically telling Trish that like, hey, you already have a site with that name, so it's not going to let you accidentally pick something that you're already using. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. We know of nonprofits that primarily, there's an organization based in the Bay Area in California that uses Google Sites to train all of their volunteers because their entire nonprofit model is based on matching volunteers um, with mentors. And so, or sorry, matching volunteers as mentors to uh, students in the community. So, you know, all that they're doing and a whole focus of their program team is like finding new volunteers, bringing them into the program, helping them get set up, connecting them with a student in a mentoring relationship and getting going. So instead of having to do that over and over again with email and kind of a bunch of different ways, they have a centralized volunteer site that has all the information that you need if you're new. Yeah. All right. Hang it. So Trish made that awesome calendar that was our volunteer orientations we have at East Bay Food Bank. And we have one tomorrow in our fictitious nonprofit. <laughs> and we want to figure out how do we get all those volunteers that signed up for afternoon slots, maybe they're actually not available to come in person in the morning to visit the East Bay Food Bank location and, and actually walk through the building and see the key code and how to plug in the, you know, the code so you can get in the back door, all that kind of stuff, right? And, but we maybe still want them to be able to come and do the training. Google has great um, video hangout conferencing kind of options through Hangouts Meet. And you can use Hangouts Meet to basically lead a virtual training. So you could have some people in person, but if you have you know, 10, 15 people that have to join from home or, or their office or wherever they are, they can do that with Hangouts Meet. So with G Suite for nonprofits, you're on the version of Hangouts Meet that has a 25 person limit in a Hangout. So if you need for some reason to 
um, basically broadcast to more than 25 people. There are some, some tricks uh, in things like YouTube that you can use to live stream, but just keep in mind that if you're inviting you know, 50 people to a Hangouts meet, the first 25 are going to get in the door and the 26th is going to get told, ooh, it's a little bit too full in there. So the best way to think about Hangouts Meet is that it's basically your video conferencing option. So if you create a calendar event, in that calendar event, there's a little option right there that says Add Conferencing, and you can click that to add Hangouts Meet to that calendar event. And Trish will show you what it looks like, but it's basically a link to a URL. So if you're on your laptop, you have your, you know, your camera ready to go, you can join from that link. If you're in the car or you're, you know, at home and you don't have a laptop, you can dial in and there's an option there as well. Any way through that, that set of links that a person decides to join, they'll all end up in the same place. So you don't have to worry about you know, who needs a phone number, who doesn't. Everybody has the same information. So should we do it? Oh, yeah, we'll go through really quick. So you can join the event straight from your calendar invite. So Trish is going to show you what this looks like, but you don't have to kind of send out a separate email saying, hey, here's the conferencing details. It's just already there if someone has accepted that calendar invite. And once you're there, you can share your screen with, your, with the group that's in that meet. You can answer questions in real time. You can see everybody's faces if they're able to join um, with, their, with their camera. And it's just a great way to actually have meetings and feel engaged with a group, even if you can't all be in the same place. So we're going to demo. Mm -hmm. OK, so again, we can start from our Gmail inbox, open our apps menu, and go to calendar. And on my calendar, because I have created the calendar for volunteer orientation, I can see that I have that event mm -hmm. scheduled for tomorrow morning. And I'm going to click on this and use the edit option up here to edit that event. Uh, and then I'm going to select to add conferencing. I'm going to add Hangouts Meet. And then we now have the ability um, to have our, our video conferencing uh, automatically added to the event. Well, I don't know, Trish, it looks like maybe the phone isn't added. What happens if you click that drop down? Well, if I click the drop, ah, drop down, the, the phone details. number is there. <laughs> um, so people can join over the phone, or they can join from their desktop or laptop. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to save this. I'm going to make it for all events, so that way this functionality is just automatically added to every orientation session. Um, and then I think we are going to pretend that it is tomorrow morning. Yeah. I'm going to start volunteer so orientation. Fast forward to the future. <laughs> so um, go ahead. I am going to join our volunteer orientation on meeting online now. Uh, Meredith is then going to join as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm a volunteer. I saw the calendar on the Google site. It's 9 AM tomorrow morning, apparently. And I'm going to join Hangouts Meet from my laptop. It tells me that Trish is in the meeting. And I can click Join. And now Meredith joined. There's just a slight delay on there's my a, there's screen. There's a slight delay. There we go. Wow. That's, yeah. So I'm going to change. I'm just going to change the layout because if we're going to review some documents, maybe a presentation together, mm -hmm. um, it's helpful for me to be able to see um, both Meredith and something that she's maybe presenting or yep. something um, that we're going to discuss together. All right. So I'm going to present. So if you, uh, Trish, you want to show them where the present now button is just in case they're wondering. So present now is just here if you yep. want to share your screen. So I'm going to present my screen to Trish because maybe it's my. Um... Yeah, it's just making sure that there we go. So maybe I want to present that we have an upcoming board meeting. I am a really well networked volunteer, <laughs> um, and there's a slight delay, but there we go. So this is my screen on my laptop that I'm presenting. The nice thing is that Trish and I can still see each other. So just because we're presenting something doesn't mean that I can't see her and she can't see me. And we can go through, and she can see me editing this document live. So in the call to order, reminder about decorum. I don't know. Everyone yeah, but potentially we could have up to 20, 25 people mm -hmm. on this one call. Um, you know, you can be reviewing a presentation or a handbook or other materials, uh, which can be edited and updated in real time. Yep. Um, and especially if you have people that are dispersed, 
It's a great way to walk everyone through. In theory, if Trish wanted to take me on a virtual tour of the East Bay Food Bank, she could just walk around with her laptop. You can also join Hangouts from your phone. So if you have your phone, you can basically switch the camera instead of showing your face to show outward and then literally walk around. And we know nonprofits that have done this. Uh, we worked with an organization in Washington, D.C. that has about 16 people in their nonprofit, but then they have thousands of volunteers and their actual physical space is not very large, so they can't just invite 30 people at a time to come visit the space and understand how everything's set up. Um, so instead of doing that, they've actually done Google Hangouts where they kind of take everyone on a virtual tour so that when volunteers show up on the first day, they sort of already know where to go and, and how to get around. Okay. okay. I'm going to hang up the call. Then. Yeah. Now let me check on the questions and see. All right. Do users have to download anything when going into a Hangout for the first time? Um, it will probably confirm with you to activate your camera or activate your microphone yeah. um, for, in order for it to function correctly. Yeah. Um, but you don't need to download anything. Nope. Um, if you're doing it on your phone, I believe you may need to, it'll prompt you to kind of like, do you want to use like, you know, Google Hangouts to go through this? But um, similar to other conferencing software where, you know, there's kind of that first set of steps. Um, Looks like I'm just checking in other questions because we have a couple of minutes here. Let's see if there's anything that the team hasn't m answered in chat. Uh, I think most of these questions have been covered. It looks like we have one way back from forms, which is fine. <laughs> we can go back there really quick to answer. Does the information collected separate so that you're not sorting through the info? I think you saw in Trisha's screen share what it looks like when it's downloaded to a spreadsheet. And you can see every question that you put into that form as its own column, and every entry into the form is a row across all the columns. So it's really easy to sort and see what people have answered and responded um, in different categories. And last but not least, oh, can answers be imported into contacts, or like how to import or export answers? So you can import and, ex sorry, you can export from you know forms to sheets, you can export from sheets to you know Excel if you wanted to. Um, you can also download the responses as a CSV if for some reason you then want to upload that into a different system. Um, forms doesn't talk directly to systems like Salesforce, but you can download that data and manipulate it to be able to be re-uploaded. And similarly, Forms doesn't automatically link to something like contacts, um, but if you ask for the information from people in the same structure, you could download it and then upload it into yeah. contacts. So there's some options there. Okay. So what does this look like when it all really comes together for a nonprofit? Um, Navigators USA is an organization that's really focused on encouraging kids and their parents to spend more time outdoors, you know, getting to know nature, getting to know one another and building their community. And the way that they're organized is that their, their national nonprofit has you know, a small group of people that runs it and they rely on a huge network of troop volunteers around the country. So different troops organizing different events and, and working with kids and families to get everybody outside. So it's important to them to be able to collaborate in a way that is efficient and effective, but then also honestly keeps data secure, right? Because they're working with kids, they're working with you know, all of the volunteers and uh, participants in their program. So Navigators USA uses forms the same way we actually talked about to intake and aggregate that feedback and data from volunteers. Google Sites to make that website that's easy for them to share and kind of spread awareness of what they're doing and get more people engaged. And then groups to securely manage that back and forth with their volunteers and all the different chapter and troop leaders. So they told us that you know Google really helped revolutionize how they can run this organization on a shoestring because G Suite for nonprofits is available for free. So uh, it's a really great opportunity if you're just getting started or if you're looking for a way to you know, manage your organization and, and the volunteers in your organization in a more efficient way. So just to, to remind everyone, a lot of what we covered today is in the Manager Volunteers How-To Guide, which you can access via that link at the bottom. Uh, and we'll also be posting this video to our channel um, so that Trish and I can just watch it over and over <laughs> again. Um, and hopefully most of your questions got answered in chat, um, but there are definitely 
lots of help resources, lots of links from this manager volunteer's guide. And honestly, too, it sounds a little bit um, cheesy, but if, you, if you're not sure about something, Googling it often turns up the Help Center article from Google for exactly how to do that thing that you're trying to figure out. So really encourage you to do that as well um, if you weren't able necessarily to get every question answered in chat. And the G Suite Learning Center as well actually has a lot of granular yeah. tutorials on with step-by-step -step instructions for how to use each of these tools. Yeah, if you want like the where, what icon do I click and then after that exactly where do I go and you want to kind of have that up when you're going through to get set up, that the G Suite Learning Center is a great uh, resource and you can literally type that into Google and it's the first thing that pops up at the top. So I think with that, we will say thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Alessia and Kyle for answering everyone's questions in chat as well. And we hope you'll join us for future live streams. Bye. All right, thank you. <laughs>